to go to therapy or not to go to therapy that's uh, that's the question for today um so thank you first of all for uh, having me with all of you here uh, we are indeed colleagues uh, but i'm glad to have the chance to contribute to this webinar in particular um so I'm based in Germany at the moment, but moving soon back to Belgium uh, this summer. Uh, I've been involved in the field of youth work and training for, I would say, three decades, more or less, starting as a youth worker, then trainer, then a bit of everything in different structures, in different organizations and institutions even. Um, and many years ago, I got in touch with uh, therapy and with training, uh, um, in that field, especially Gestalt, and uh, and since then I really never stopped till today to really train myself in uh, different approaches, different schools. Uh, so today I can say that I'm half trainer or facilitation of learning or consultant. You can you can tick the one you want, uh, but at the same time, indeed, I'm a, I'm a therapist. So again, once again, really glad to be here. Thank you, Giselle. Petra Ivana. <laughs> I can go. <laughs> My name is Petra. Uh, I'm from Slovakia. And as a Giselle, I am I have two positions. Also, I'm a trainer, facilitator, but also psychotherapist. Actually, psychotherapist in the training. So I'm finalizing my education in psychotherapy. Um I am also a youth worker, and I think as you guys, I have definitely the same path. A bit of cleaning lady, a bit of youth worker, a bit of trainer, uh, but mainly these days and these years, um, lately, a psychotherapist uh, working online. And since April, I opened my own office as a psychotherapist, so um, focusing also on offline world <laughs> and offline psychotherapy. Thank you, Petra. And we have Ivana. Yeah, great to hear that, Petra. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ivana. And very similar uh, to, to Petra and Giselle, I am also, uh, I used to call myself youth worker and youth trainer with background in psychology, but now the balance has changed a little bit. So I'm a lot more into uh, psychotherapy since I uh, uh started and then finished the advanced training in uh in psychotherapy so now i'm under supervision but i still uh work also as a youth worker and trainer on national and international level um and i work uh, at the moment in an organization here working with young people uh, uh who are uh, members of lgbt community so my background, I mean, not background, but my uh, practice now is more like connecting youth work somehow with psychotherapists, so giving uh, support to uh, young people and then like principles of youth work really, really help in, in that as well. Um, and I also have a, pri a few private clients that I see online and offline, so it really depends. Um, and I'm based in Novi Sad in Serbia. I'm really happy to be here because I'm also part of the team of Holistic Trainer as well as uh, Petra. So we are like in many roles uh, here today on this webinar. Um, and yeah, looking forward to to giving some um, um, some backgrounds on, on therapy and answering some questions maybe. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Then maybe <laughs> we can go to... Uh, straight to the aim <laughs> and maybe we then can start and uh, yeah we can start with the with your presentation I know that there was a question no that you wanted to start with as Katya said uh, at the beginning of this project we had focus groups and people uh, shared uh, a bit of reasons why they also found therapy useful and why they uh, maybe think that uh, therapy is one of the tools to help with anxiety and stress and burnout and things that we face as trainers. So we want to also ask you, and uh, this link uh, that uh, Katya will send uh, will lead you to Padlet, uh, with the questions of what would be your reasons to start therapy. So if you are thinking about it now, or you think it might help, or you already are in therapy, so 
what led you to to this decision? So not, now we have answers to both questions here, uh, but let's just try um, uh, processing and uh, reflecting on actions and reactions uh, about answering some questions uh, that is difficult to to answer alone, tackling um, ADHD and procrastination for professional support for emotional breakdown, um, focusing on working on ourselves. Um, Controlling thoughts and feelings. Moving on. And let's see if um, there is anything here. Yeah. Some people were nice to repeat. <laughs> to integrate my story and my relationship with my family members. Manage work-life balance. Avoid burnout, that's really great time to start to avoid it. Tackle anxiety. Also to manage relationships with young people from complex backgrounds. Yeah, so uh, working with people with trauma and uh, difficulties in their life can also bring some difficulties to, to our emotional well-being. We want you to balance a bit of um, theoretical uh, input with with some reflection on our own lives as as trainers. So to start with uh, a very basic things of what is psychotherapy, as probably uh, most of people know, but uh, um, just a, a bit to uh, to introduce things. Uh, psychotherapy refers to different kinds of treatments that are. Uh, usually dealing with words, and uh, we talked about this, it's uh, sometimes called talk therapy, uh, to make it different from uh, therapy um, that you can take, like uh, medications. And uh, it can help uh, a person to identify and change some uh, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors that might be troubling and might bring some difficulties in your life. Um, and uh, it can be individual, so when you're working with a therapist alone, it can be uh, many forms of group therapy with different approaches, uh, or you can bring the whole family or couples to counseling or, or, or therapy. And um, as you already mentioned, some of the reasons, the goals of psychotherapy or the things that you can bring to therapy and work on can be really different and are, of course, personal. And it's usually something that uh, is either relieving from symptoms. So if you have some um, issues that, that you want uh, to get rid of, uh, to maintain or enhance your uh, functioning, so your, uh, your life, and uh, in general, improve quality of life. So um, let's move on. Can... Yeah, so I, I can I can continue with that one. Um, you you saw because of the Padlet that there is this question about what you're looking uh, for uh, in a therapist. But when we prepared this webinar, we thought that it might be important to underline also a few perspective from our side. Um, and one of them is the the importance of the relationship between the client. Client is my uh, terminology. I don't like to use patient because patient induces that someone is uh, sick or ill. So I take responsibility for that. So I use the word the terms client, but you will hear a lot patient client uh, in general. So the, the the importance of the of the relationship um, and of elements like trust, confidence, uh, of course, feeling free to express yourself and safe to do so. Um, we see those as really fundamental criteria for choosing a therapist, which also means that you have or you should feel completely free to tell a therapist after a while, uh, this is not working for me. And that's totally OK. And I can share a personal example. I just changed my therapist. We had our first session a few days ago and she said exactly the same. Uh, we give it a try for a few and then and then we see um, how it goes. Um, 
suspending judgment uh, is something you will see throughout our inputs as well. So the, the importance to stay as much as possible with what is observable and the facts. So to really try to uh, not to go jump immediately into interpretation, into judgments, because that bias is already a little bit uh, the, the experience and, and the, the, the co-creation process, because even if it's therapy, it's co-creation as well. Uh, and finally, just to say that there are, of course, short-term therapies. Um, you might come across several if you search a little bit more, but usually uh, a therapeutic journey is a long-term one. So it's not something that is solved um, uh, in a snap, except when it's something really specific, like for burnout, it might be shorter because once the, the process is over, then it's already long in itself. But let's say when it's, when it's somehow solved, if I can use this word, uh, then it can take another shape, but usually it takes it takes a bit of time. So we thought those might be already some thoughts for you to keep in mind. And many of you, uh, you shared also why or what you are looking for a on the therapist, and there are very very significant question about, okay, so who do I need when I have this issue when I'm facing this challenge? Is it friend, good friend, or psychotherapist, or coach and mentor? Uh, how do I know to who I should go? And um, when people are asking these questions, usually I'm using the metaphor of rope that. You have your good friend on one side of the rope and you are on the other side of the rope. And maybe you know, but sometimes when you are sharing <laughs> some challenge you have, this rope is not only on your side. Sometimes your friend has a the best advice which helped um, them. Uh, sometimes they are sharing, sometimes they are very pushing you, which is sometimes good, <laughs> sometimes not. Uh, so it's not quite even, the whole relationship. And sometimes you are also... Uh, not finding the support you need. And then uh, there is a question, okay, so we have these three positions, these three roles, coach, mentor, and psychotherapist. To whom I should go? When I know that maybe, okay, my friends, uh, they have enough of me talking about the same thing all around. And again, again, uh, to coach, uh, we can uh, go with specific goals when we want to really work on something specific and it's more about developing skills and strategies to achieve them. I would not like to put uh, to kind of compare coach and psychotherapist because many good coaches, they are using psychotherapic methods <laughs> or they have this approach and many, many psychotherapists, including me, they're also coaches <laughs> and we are using also coaching tools on uh, and methods. So, with coach, just very trying to find some differences that you are using, oh, sorry, that you are focusing on developing skills and strategies to achieve them. How, what I need to achieve that. And coach is trying to support you, opening doors for you. With the psychotherapist, we are talking about therapeutic interventions. So is it a person who is treated and who learn how to use specific methods and specific tools to not only support you, but to overcome physical, uh, physical mental challenges. And mentor, um, imagine that um, you are looking for some answers, maybe uh, in your business, maybe in your work. Mentor is somebody who've been there, who've done that, and you need the answer. This person can actually and definitely give you the advice how to get to your goal, how to get uh, what you need, or maybe to share the experiences they have with you. Okay, so. Okay, so now we go to the question about what you look for in a therapist. So um, if you haven't uh, already, uh, you can go to that link and we will share it once again. Now, uh, hopefully the right one. And then um, we'll be happy to, to see what are your thoughts on um, 
not maybe perfect, but the therapies that suits you the best and what would be your cr criteria or the things that you will look for. And there is a question, what do I look uh, for in the therapist as a person or a therapy in the service as the service? Uh, it's an interesting question and I think it could be both. So if you have some thoughts on what do you look for when you're looking for a therapist as, a, I would say, more a process or um, yeah, a service, uh, then do share that as well. Because in the uh, next part, we want to also share the three different approaches that the three of us have. So kind of like three different therapy schools. Um, so you can also see the difference in how we work and how we are trained to, <laughs> to work as well. So it's, um, it's connected to, to that. Um, and because some people already shared, I will uh, share this Padlet now on the screen to see which of the answers we already got. Um, and it's background and experience. Uh, uh, it's important that they are trauma-informed and uh, decolonize their practice. That's uh, an interesting uh, idea, neutrality and support. Uh, uh, affirmation approach. Mm. Somebody who does not only repeat. <laughs> so what do you think about that? <laughs> like a parrot? <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else? Act, expertise, okay. Okay, so thank you for the answers. Uh, it will, uh -huh, uh, oh, I just, um, so it, the last second that there is a new answer. Someone who feels similar to me in some ways, but can give me a different perspective. That's very specific and very, um, yeah, interesting. Okay, so maybe some um, answers will come also, um, after you hear uh, the approaches that we have. So we'll start with Giselle, right? Perhaps it's also good to say that just looking at the Padlet, for instance, now you can you can really see that there are different different approaches and different schools. Trauma-informed therapy is one. You have ACT uh, on, on the Padlet. So we are just presenting uh, what is our main approach, our main school, um, but it's not meant to be uh, uh, just a closed list. So um, I'm a therapist and I mostly um, uh, work with Gestalt therapy, which is a humanistic or one of the humanistic uh, therapies or formats that very much look at the uh, experience uh, or experiential approach or put in other terms, uh, the experiences that uh, we as human beings we go through and how they form ourselves. And Gestalt really looks at how do we as individual perceive and understand the world? Um, so we work very much with, with that um, approach in mind, and you will see with the next slides that it becomes uh, much clearer. Uh, it's a German term uh, that um, can be described as the form or as the whole. Um, but of course, that might also be further uh, defined, but that's a bit the idea that we work with what is basically becoming a shape, becoming clear, becoming a clear picture that you can then have the capacity to uh, to uh, to understand and to act upon. It was developed uh, in the 50s by uh, Fritz and Laura Peirce uh, and uh, Paul Goodman, but then it continued to develop uh, through other 
additions or other approaches uh, that supported developing Gestalt further, like the one of Ralf uh, Hefferlin. So they were all psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, uh, and it was a big boom also in the 70s. That's where many uh, many of the approaches, 60s, 70s, started to, to emerge. Um, maybe we, yes. So these are just key concepts, and I don't expect that in a, in a few minutes you will, uh, you will have a full understanding of Gestalt, but hopefully that helps a little bit. There are so, some key concepts uh, in Gestalt, which are uh, on the left of the screen. So you have perception and cognition. So what do you perceive? What do you sense? And how do you connect that with knowledge? What do you make it uh, or what do you make of it? So uh, it's a bit like if you see a, a picture, you don't only see, see lines and colors, but you understand that this is a chair, for instance. So this is really the relation between what you perceive and what you process as something that you know. Um, it's also very much connected to the principle of the figure and the ground, uh, meaning that there are things that you start sensing, there are things that you start uh, being aware of, and slowly it's taking shape, but at the same time there is still a whole ground of underlying, um, you can call it issues uh, or problems or solutions even, uh, that are not yet that you're not yet conscious of. They are not yet visible. They are not even necessarily uh, sensed. So it's really about this uh, this principle, holism, that in the sense that we work with uh, with everything. We work with your uh, mind. You, we work with your soul. We work with your body, uh, with your heart. So it's really taking this concept that um, uh, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. So it's that's a very very impor important important uh, principle. Sorry, in Gestalt. Uh, together with the here and now. So it's a, it's a therapy that looks at what's happening at the moment in the session with the client, even if you talk about the past. So if you talk about something that happened before, or even that goes back to generations, uh, we very much focus on how is this felt right now? How is this informing you right now? Uh, and we work with, with that. So it's really, that's also very uh, important and very different than you would have, for instance, in a, in more, I would say, um, standard psychology where you might, or even psychiatry where you might really go back to, uh, to, to in time, but really be back in time as well. And then the last is uh, the phenomenological approach. It's a bit what I was uh, sharing at the beginning as an important uh, aspect to, to consider, which is we work with what is as factual as possible. It's not, it's not possible to be completely phenomenological, but we work with what we can observe during the session. Uh, the person is blushing, or you have goosebumps, or the person is constantly looking elsewhere, or there is a window there that is attractive, or you're scratching your nose constantly, or there are words that, I don't know, the client doesn't manage to pronounce. I mean, I could go with a very long list, but you really work with what you can observe, because this is what you can really work on. And that reduces the possibility or the risk to constantly be judging, be interpreting, being wondering, okay, what does that mean? What should I do with that? So you really work with what is there uh, in Gestalt. And the, the goal of the that uh, form of therapy is really to reconnect with the body. So it's, it's, it's called the body uh, therapy as well with emotion. So connect to your emotion, understand when they appear, what do they tell you? Um, and to recreate movement, because at least in, in the way I was trained on Gestalt, uh, there is this um, um, certitude that movement is life. So when you are stuck, you are not basically living to your full potential. So it's really about recreating movement in your life and uh, and becoming alive again. And the pictures you have before, some of you might have used that in, a, in training courses already. It's these kind of uh, shapes where you can see two... Um, to different images, uh, although they have the same uh, components. So that's also uh, connected to the principle of figure and ground and perception and cognition, for instance. So those are the key concepts in a nutshell. Um, and that is what we call the Gestalt cycle or on the slide, the Gestalt cycle of experience. It's not the therapy that follows a certain protocol. You have therapies that really follow a protocol. You first have to do A, you first have to do B, and then C, and, and so on and so on. In Gestalt, you don't have a protocol, but there is a cycle which usually starts with what you see on top, which is the sensation. And that's a bit this, this feeling of, okay, I sense something is happening. Uh, I sense something is coming. Uh, something is coming from the ground. Uh, 
you're not sure yet what it is, and slowly it moves in 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 it moves in a state of awareness where you really start to understanding what is that about, which helps the the clients uh, or you if you follow a gestalt therapy to mobilize yourself. Your senses are getting uh, mobilized. Your body is getting mobilized, which supports. Um, taking actions or taking decisions about what to put in actions. And that's usually really where uh, what we call in Gestalt, the contact with your environment is the strongest. So it's the moment where you are mobilized, you can take actions. It's You could also see this in our training jargon, a sense of agency. You are ready. Uh, and this is where you are fully connected with everything that is around you. And usually that gives um, or that leads us to a certain stage of satisfaction. And finally, withdrawal in the sense of, okay, the whole Gestalt cycle is finalized. And then, of course, it continues and it can it can start again, but on other issues. Um, we talk in Gestalt a lot about unfinished businesses, which could also, in a way, be connected to this cycle that is interrupted in, in many different ways. I'm not going to go into details, but there are a lot of elements like projection, introjection, uh, for instance, and many others that can interrupt the cycle um and connect sometimes to experiences in your life that you could never really co complete or, or or deal with to uh, to reaching a sense of completion so that's uh that's what we call the gestalt cycle and as therapists we try of course we don't always manage but we try to go through uh through the whole cycle um maybe if we can go to the next slide um yes these are a few quotes um, that I thought could illustrate a little bit these principles that I was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, the whole is bigger than the sum of its part. This is a quote you probably heard a lot. It's the quote that you can use in systemic and holistic work as well. So you can take many different parts, but when you put all of them together, the whole is much bigger than, than the elements. Be here now, that's uh, the, the connection with the uh, Gestalt therapy being looking at the what's happening here now. Um, Carl Rogers, that probably you have used also a lot uh, in training, uh, and especially looking at the cycle of change. Um, when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. So it's also this idea that you reach a moment where you can see yourself, accept yourself, love yourself, recognize yourself as you are. And then at that moment, you can decide to take actions on what you need to improve, change, you you use the word you want, but basically when, when something can transform. Uh, all life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. Um, I said at the beginning, Gestalt is an experiential, experiential sorry, therapy. So it really works with uh, all the experiences we, uh, we have in our lives, those that we let go, those that we keep on working with, um, but they contribute to who we are. And finally, uh, what Virginia said about uh, her as a therapist, I am a companion. I try to help people tune into their own wisdom. Um, I could even take the liberty to adjust that quote a little bit into not I try to help, but I try to be useful for people to tune into their own wisdom. Because in the end of the day, we are therapists, we are companions, yes, but the wisdom, the client has it. So it's just about uh, reestablishing the connection. And what you see on the right um, is a little or a long quote or a mini poem by Fritz Perls, so one of the founders of Gestalt that says, I do my things and you do your things. Uh, I am not in this world to live up to your expectations and you are not in, uh, in this world to live up to mine. You are you and I am I. And if by chance we find each other, it's beautiful. And if not, it cannot be helped. So it's really all about the, the therapeutic relationship between uh, uh, in this case, a the therapist and the client. But it's also that you are not there to constantly um, uh, live up to the expectations of others. And so that's, I think, an important approach that he had when he started to um, to develop the Gestalt therapy. And I think there's one more uh, little slide, uh, which is more about the way I work. So I was looking also at what you search, for instance, when you when you look for a therapist. I personally work only online at the moment, uh, but partially because I live in a world like you where we move a lot, we travel a lot. So I need to have flexibility and therefore I need to be flexible for my clients. I have personally clients that are uh, literally in different parts of the world, uh, which includes different time zones, which includes also uh, 
different way to connect and to adjust. And of course, uh, it's uh, it's important when you are dealing with groups who have um, a lot of movement in their life, not only personally inside, but also geographically. Um, when I work as a therapist, I try not immediately, but in the, at the beginning of the, the first sessions to define the frame. You can call it contract, you can call it agreement about the way we work, which is about the duration of the sessions, the rhythm, uh, when do you pay, how much do you pay, what happens if you cancel and these kind of things, but also uh, making very clear with the, with the client how I work, basically, that, so that the person is also able to say, mm, maybe that's not for me. Um, I work with what Kain brings. That's uh, very important in Gestalt. As I said, we work with the here and now. So I don't have big plans. I don't uh, start a session thinking, oh, today I will work on this or I will work on that. Of course, you have directions you are following. But if something else emerges during the session, you work with that because that's present at the moment. It's there for a reason. Again, holding judgment, being curious, constantly asking questions, uh, not about how do you feel about that, but really about trying to, to bring curiosity in the relationship uh, and insisting on the fact that we are together, the therapist and the client, we work together. This is really co-creation of the therapeutic process. And I do share, not all therapists do that, but in Gestalt, it's, uh, it happens a lot. I can share how uh, what is being happening uh, has uh, in terms of impact on me. I can be touched, I can be emotional, uh, I can have a goosebump. Uh, so... Of course, you don't share that all the time, but uh, it's also okay to share the impact because that's what happens in a relation. It's not a one direction. Um, and as I explained earlier, it's a lot about body. So very often I try to bring back the client into feeling, into sensing what's happening, into describing emotions. And if it's not about uh, using words or if it's too hard, I try to um uh, allow the space for giving it colors even connecting to music or whatever or movement but really making sure that the, the person is still connected to uh, to uh, to his or her body and um, i'm not uh, really a person who does only gestalt i use other approaches that be, i've been trained on or i'm being trained on at the moment being internal family systems or systemic and family constellations for instance there was someone putting on the padlets about uh, the, the stories of the family. So that's, for instance, where you really go back to your family system, your family history, and you really look at what's, what's still there that impacts you today and that might simply be called or be calling for um, a resolution, uh, for instance. So there are others, um, uh, somatic experience, which is a lot about trauma and, uh, and, and a few more. So I try, I give Gestalt the priority, but when the principles and the um, the key concepts are not opposite, but rather go along. I uh, I use also other approaches. So I think in a nutshell, that's what I can say about Gestalt. And of course, I invite you to, to read a bit more if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. It was a question. We will have time for the questions, but it was a very specific question about the Gestalt therapy, if Gestalt therapy includes somatic practices. Um, you can. Um, because there is uh, some connection in this phenom phenomenological approach, for instance, which is also important when you deal with trauma healing uh, and other concepts. However, the whole trauma-informed uh, therapy or healing processes have their own processes as well, so or their own principles. So you can connect both, I do, uh, but it really depends on the depths of the trauma. I, I have a person that is accumulating far too many traumas, for instance, to uh, to be able to do only Gestalt uh, and, and even to be able to do that only online. And in that, that case, you just simply uh, pass that person on to a colleague who might just be able to support better. So it's not antagonist, but it's not exactly the same. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for answering this question. I didn't say it before, but we will have special time for the questions and answers. Of course, if there are like this small question about concrete uh, type of therapy that we are talking now, you can use the chat as you did. And then if you have more questions, then you can uh, keep them <laughs> for the special time for this. Uh, thank you, Giselle, for uh, sharing um about your approach and what is Gestalt therapy in general. And uh, then I pass floor <laughs> to Ivana to Jonas. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now, now listening to uh, 
to Giselle, I realized how uh, many approaches have very, very similar things and uh, things in common. So I will try not to repeat uh, many things. So I come from a transactional analysis background. Uh, and uh, in uh, again, uh, a lot of these uh, therapeutic approaches that are now um, practiced are uh, from the mid uh, last century. So TA started in the 60s. Um, as a kind of social psychology, because uh, Eric Berg, who um, created the concept, was a psychiatrist and psycho in psych psychoanalysis, and he wanted to kind of modernize psych psychoanalysis and to make it uh, more in um, kind of with the times uh, and more practical uh, to 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 solve some of the issues that uh, clients brought. Uh, so uh, the whole theory behind uh, have a lot of concepts that explain uh, relationships uh, among people, uh, personality development, and so on. And um, it includes really different concepts. Um, uh, and they, um, I mean, the whole theory is not only applied in psychotherapy, but also in education and in organizational development. So. Um, it's kind of more broad in this sense. Uh, but when you are being trained, then you choose uh, your direction. So I'm in, in, in psychotherapy and not I don't know a lot about organization and education in the frame of TA. So, but um, like the, the core principles of transactional analysis, analysis in any uh, direction that you take and also in psychotherapy is that you come with the perception and uh, uh, like um, uh, attitude that people are okay, which make, means that fundamentally you accept uh, people as they are and you don't judge them regardless of how they're thinking, how they're feeling at that moment where they are in their life, uh, you value them as a person. Um, then we also think like we believe that people are able to think for themselves. So this means that therapists are not making any decisions, but uh, actually supporting clients, of course, to make their own. And um, also that uh, people uh, decide their own destiny, which means that uh, TA believes that some of the decisions are made like in very, very early childhood. But because we made it as, as kids, as babies sometimes, we are also the ones that have the power to change them. So in the process of therapy, you actually decide how you want your life to look like with the support of, of a therapy uh, and therapist. Um, and of course, you're the one who are achieving your goal. Uh, so you're making your own, own choices. And some basic TA concepts that maybe you also, I, I've heard it from trainers and I've been on trainings before where uh, uh, some of the, the uh, TA concepts were introduced in the process of non-formal education. So basically what is uh, usually popular is these life positions uh, that um, TA thinks that we take also very early on. Uh, and the basic life position of I'm okay and you are okay is something that we uh, nurture in the clients and in the uh, among, I don't know, in supervision and, and so on. So it's without judgment and again, coming with this idea that I'm okay as a person and you are okay and you're valuable and uh, worthy of, their, of respect. Um, and it's, for example, in, in our world, very important to give feedback uh, from this position that I'm okay and you're okay. Then the kind of personality theory is uh, this ego state uh, that uh, TA says there are three, a uh, child, adult, and, and uh, uh, parent. Uh, so uh, they kind of contain some of the past and uh, adult ego, ego state is something that you use in the present that's very <laughs> very shortly uh, but they represent the systems of uh, thoughts feelings and behaviors uh, that we use actually to interact with each other and a lot of TA is about interaction and about relationships with uh, with others 
uh, then TA believes that uh, people are really surviving and striving when they have re interpersonal recognition and they need strokes and strokes in a sense of uh, not like a, a, a disease stroke, but uh, strokes as something that uh, is like a unit of uh, recognition. Uh, when you stroke somebody, I don't know how what could be other word, but when you're gentle to somebody, uh, that uh, is maybe the, the closest trans, uh, translation. Um, and then the theory of communication uh, is based on transactions and um, the kind of different models of how we relate, depending on which ego state we use to communicate. So for example, when we ask for help, are we asking as here and now adults that need uh, support from each other, or we are in, uh, let's say, child ego state and we really need a parent to take care of us. So these kinds of um, different levels of communications are, um, are explained with transactions. Um, we also have live scripts. So uh, as I said, some of the of, uh, of the decisions uh, that we take uh, before we are even conscious and um, we decide about ourselves, others, and how the life is going to go for us. And uh, one big goal of therapy in TA is changing the, like first discovering what your script is and then changing it uh, to fit the reality and changing some of those poor decisions that you made and that are not working anymore because you realize that actually life is not the way you you thought it it was when you were two years old or or even earlier. Uh, then very uh, interesting uh, concept of games, um, which is something that we might uh, sometimes call manipulations or like the ways people try to interact with each other to. Uh, gain some kind of recognition or, or fulfill some needs, but in games you usually have these uh, uh, negative feelings and uh, 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 negative interactions as an outcome and something feeling not very good. Uh, and they're also something that we learn throughout our upbringing and so socialization. So we uh, kind of repeat the pattern and then a, a big part also of psychotherapy and uh, relating to uh, a client is to expose the games and see how we can uh, uh, interact and relate to each other without these um, uh, kinds of uh, um, needs to um, evoke uh, negative feelings but to, uh, to be more like uh, intimate in a way. And, and honest. And then uh, a very important thing in TA is contracts. So in any kind of application that you use the theory, and uh, this means also in psychotherapy, we start with some goals. It's when I was in training, it reminded me on writing projects. Uh, so you ask the client uh, what would be the change that they want to do, what would be the goal of therapy for them, why they, they came. And then you actually really um, try to define it as best uh, you can with some indicators so that you know that at the end, when you are, I mean, the client is basically satisfied with the results, you can also see how we can measure, like what kind of behaviors, how are we going to see the change? And um, of course, it doesn't mean that you uh, only work on uh, therapy, like you work on a project, but it means it gives uh, more power to the client. And uh, as Giselle said, uh, it means that the therapist doesn't have uh, their own uh, kind of agenda and uh, thoughts on uh, what I think this client needs to change, but the, the power is in the in client's head, hands. Uh, so this is more uh, the, the concepts that were developed in the 60s and later on and they are part of this classical TA uh, approach. And uh, this is like the basic training that, uh, that I also got. But then uh, somewhere in the 90s, a relational transactional analysis started to, to develop and it uh, has a lot of uh, connection with Gestalt as well as some of the 
of the concepts are taken from there um, because it was uh, perceived kind of that uh, relationship is the central um, uh, has central importance in the in the psychotherapy and that uh, psychotherapeutic relationship is something that can be then translated into life. So the, the way clients relate to uh, their therapist can also improve their uh, uh, relationships outside of, of therapy, of course. Uh, so this is the approach that uh, I took and that uh, I was trained in, and I really love it uh, because it's... Um, it again has uh, is giving also like some kind of equal position to uh, therapist and the client. Um, it is the relationship that we co-create together, which means that um, I can, as a therapist, always ask what is happening and not what I did or what you did, but like what is happening in the room right now and what are we creating. Um, it means also that the therapist is using a lot uh, themselves, also similar to what uh, uh, Giselle says, that uh, uh, I, as a therapist, am reflecting a lot. And to some extent, I share how I experience what the client is bringing. So if they're sharing something, I can say how I feel about that. And sometimes uh, uh, people have kind of forbidden emotions, so they can't get angry to I don't know, their parents or authorities. And then some, then it's really useful if a therapist says, like, this looks like something that could make me angry or something like that. So it brings uh, some of the context inside. But it's also important for me as a, someone who is in youth work is the, that we work a lot in the context. So we don't put uh, all the, let's say, responsibility only on a... Uh, personality, uh, but we are taking into consideration the social and political contexts and the upbringing and the culture where uh, where we grow up and where clients grow grow up. Uh, so this is also something that is that is in the therapy room uh, uh, while we are we are talking about personal stuff. Um, it is also my approach to be uh, like empathetically curious. So curious with the aim of finding out more and understanding better. Uh, but also uh, it is constant, like criticism is not maybe the, the best word, but uh, constant analysis also of how I feel and bringing a lot of uh, the stuff um, and a lot of my experiences to supervision to see uh, what am I not seeing in the process and so on. Uh, and also inviting clients to uh, be curious and to ask and to criticize or to give um, some kind of a feedback or, or to say how they feel in the relationship because this gives them, again, this power and potency to, to change. Um, and, of course, uh, creativity whenever it is, it is possible to uh, not stick to a kind of... Um, uh, only a basic theoretical concepts, but going a bit outside and being creative with uh, with my work. Um, but then at the same time, as also Giselle mentioned on the, the beginning, I like to set kind of a clear structure and boundaries. And uh, this contract that I mentioned, uh, which is also uh, something that I create together with the clients, uh, I work online and I work offline and I work a lot with young people and my experience, especially with young people, is that sometimes they need uh, kind of structure and uh, the feeling that somebody will be there every week at the same time. Uh, and uh, this brings them like kind of peace <laughs> that they will have uh, this space once a week uh, uh, just for themselves. So um, I'm trying to, to also create that and to set some boundaries because that also comes both ways. So uh, when, we, when we say what we can and when, what we can do or want to do, then also clients feel free to, to say and to share what, what are their, their limits uh, and what are their needs. So this is, I think it's um, 
in short about uh, TA and then some questions if they arise, we can also cover. Mm. For a moment, there are no questions written. <laughs> I don't see any hands. <laughs> Ivana, maybe how long the session takes you? Ah, there is one message. Wait. The AI is very fascinating. Would you say that to effectively size it, storytelling skills are crucial from both the therapist and the client? Well, I wouldn't say storytelling, but there is some something about stories in TA. Uh, I was fascinated, uh, for example, with uh, life scripts and there are these classical books of TA that connect scripts to fairy tales. And this is kind of very, uh, very interesting if you if this is maybe what, what you meant. Uh, but uh, I had um, also clients who maybe have troubles expressing themselves and then it is always also possible to, I don't know, uh, work with the body or work with um, whatever is like in um, in the beginning of therapy, we work with the communication channel that the, the client brings. So people are either thinking or feeling or behaving. So they talk about uh, these terms um, and then... Um, me as a therapy and as a therapist, I try to to adapt to what they're bringing. Okay, thank you. Then let's move to. Okay, there is one new mess. Okay, uh, then I will pass floor to Petra, and you will talk about systematic approaches. Uh, am I right? Yes. And thank you very much for making a bridge for me, because there was a question about stories and uh, systemic approach focused on two or three even kind of paths or uh, methods you can use, kind of way. One is focusing-oriented psychotherapy and the second is narrative therapy. And um, maybe you noticed <laughs> I will be the third one who will share uh, my approach, my psychotherapeutic approach. But I also want to share kind of the story uh, behind the scene that also for us, for therapists, is very crucial uh, to choose which psychotherapy uh, we see ourselves doing as a psychotherapist but also for you as a client for me it was quite easy because um, in my master uh, I studied um, psychology and we had these two days uh, classes and it was about systemic psychotherapy and every activity every workshop I was asking the same question like yeah but how differently would you do it of course it's you need to ask this question and of course it's of course, it makes sense, everything. So after these two days, I knew, okay, systemic approach is something I love and definitely is coming from my um, fundamental um, theories I work with, also as a person. For you, it's quite the same. Now we are only three therapies here, uh, talking about three different uh, psychotherapic approaches, but there are more, and I don't want to scare you. <laughs> there are definitely more. What I would recommend or what... Um, people do is usually uh, they ask friends, but also there is this uh, kind of um, um, problematic part that uh, what works for my friend and what uh, therapist is good for my friend, most probably uh, it won't be good for me. So what I would, uh, where I would like to invite you is really to kind of dig more, try out uh, and read about different approaches. Maybe just to Google, okay, I want to go to psychotherapy, what kind of possibilities I have. To go really through maybe some theoretical parts, maybe uh, what people do, uh, what clients do in, in the sessions that would help you to choose. And then definitely try out. As Giselle said at the beginning, uh, maybe you are not good match with your therapist and that is absolutely okay to say like, really, I don't feel it. Also, just not forget that psychotherapy is not um, going through the peak of the mountain, that you are going um, step by step and still improving step by step and session by session. It's more, um, it is more about kind of like sinusoida, that uh, after one session you are like, yeah, I, I can do it, I'm hyped, uh, <laughs> I know all my answers. And then the second session is like, oh, shit, <laughs> this is not good, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> right direction. 
and it's going up and down. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the the aim is to go only kind of up or to find uh, the methods uh, which work for me when I will find myself in the, this down spot. Uh, but let's not forget that psychotherapy is really process and it's kind of long term, even though that, for example, systemic approach is a short term psychotherapy. Um, focusing oriented psychotherapy works with social constructivism or the base is social constructivism. And to give you example, now please think about the chair. Imagine one chair. Do you have it? Do you have this one chair? Super. And now if we are going to share and if we would share what kind of chair you have on your mind, my chair is completely different. My chair is uh, wooden and uh, my grandpa usually sat on it and it's almost kind of break, uh, like at the breaking point, but your chair, it might be uh, red or pink or iron. And with this social constructivism, we work also in systemic approach. Uh, we are coming uh, and we are telling different stories we are individuals, part of the larger systems, and the systems we are creating that uh, we are trying to connect. It means that I am not only Petra, um, psychotherapist now in this session, but also I'm Petra, daughter. I'm Petra, friend of uh, the group of my friends. I'm Petra, teacher. I'm Petra, youth worker, as we mentioned at the beginning. And you are always part of some system and your role is kind of trying to balance that, to find your way, to find in which system you actually belong. Because <laughs> to be true, told, you are belonging to every system. Um, in systemic approach, psychotherapist is not expert because you have your story, you have your truth, you have your uh, social construct, you have your construct of your reality. So my position is not to give you advice and... <laughs> I'm not expert even at my life. <laughs> so giving you advice, it's kind of, uh, yeah, <laughs> it won't help. Uh, and we work, uh, we dialogue, uh, we listen. We are not always asking question, can you repeat? And what do you think about it? We are also sharing mm, maybe our example, examples, maybe some stories uh, of our clients uh, to give you kind of uh, maybe mm, support you need. I always uh, say that uh, systemic approach and being psychotherapist in systemic approach is kind of being a Columba, you know, this detective, that you kind of know where it is going, that you know uh, kind of maybe the path and maybe the right answers, but you are just curious and you are just asking the questions. Um, and the first question I am uh, asking at the first session is, what do you think therapy will do for you? Because the agenda and what we are going to discuss, what we are going to check from many, many uh, angles, you are bringing as a client. So I am. I don't have agenda. I don't have, okay, now we are working on that. Um, this session, the next session, we can check this aspect of your challenges. Uh, you are bringing that. And uh, we work also many, many times, maybe even every session with scaling. So we are also involving a bit uh, body movements. It's also possible online. So sometimes it's just saying, okay, so from one to 10, where do you see yourself now and where you would like to be? Uh, to understanding that 10 is kind of a <laughs> big, uh, how to say, big cut, <laughs> big bite. Uh, but also in online, it works uh, perfectly when somebody, clients, they are more into movements that they can step, step up and move with the camera. It's quite easy. So we are using the scaling progress and focusing on strengths. We are not working with pathology. We are not for working um even some clients, they're coming with a, a doctor description and um uh, what they have and what somebody told them for us is quite not important for me what is important is that till now you somehow works how it is possible that even that you have that you are facing so many ch challenges it, it it works for you that you reach this level that you are even uh, asking for help and that you are even trying to help yourself so we are really focusing on strengths and exceptions uh, to these problematic patterns. What worked in the past? What are these glimpses, these sparkling moments? 
uh, which you can actually repeat even with your system as one, but also maybe uh, in the system with the others. The next um, approach in systemic approach is narrative therapy. And then uh, where the story or storytelling uh, starts, and uh, to answer this question, no, you don't need to be a great storyteller. Uh, ask somebody who knows me. I'm, <laughs> I really, I am not a good storyteller, but still <laughs> I'm doing narrative therapy because narrative therapy is about your story, about your personal story. Um, for example, there is one small activity which you can try. Uh, and I would like to invite you to do it that uh, in the evening, maybe you will have some time for yourself with a cup of tea, just write your life story, right from the moment you want till now, what happened in your life. And then keep it for yourself and read it uh, tomorrow. And then read the same story after one week and then after one month. What kind of changes and what kind of moments which not collide <laughs> after one week, after two weeks, after one month, you will find there. Because narrative therapy is all about that, that you have your dominant story, but we are trying to, to take, take it out like Lego, that you are not just tower built by Lego bricks, but we are taking one by one and trying to remodel it, remodel it <laughs> and externalizing the problem that you are not the problem, you are you. What you are facing, what you are challenges um, is the problem by itself. And how it is possible that you are still kind of here, that you are the same asking for the help, that you are um, even day by day, that you are capable of uh, being you with that problem. And what that problem can do for you or even how it can be kind of maybe uh, how this problem can be a friend of yours. So we are this deconstructing the dominant narrative and definitely uh, my role is to empower you, to take the ownership of your own story, that you are you and your story, it's your story. And you have the pen, which is actually writing. So how you decide to write your story, it's absolutely all about you. So we are uh, working mainly uh, with writing letters, with uh, encouraging celebration and certificates, and also uh, we are working not only on this individual level, but we are inviting people from your systems to come to the session. So it's not couple therapy, but we are calling these people who are coming, maybe your mom, maybe your friend, maybe your husband, wife, uh, as a witnesses, because these are the witnesses uh, of your success, of you, of your story, that it works. Um, we are also working with uh, homeworks, uh, and when client says, yeah, homeworks are not for me, it's also okay, because this is your story you want to write. That would be from systemic approach. Uh, thank you, Petra. Uh, okay, we don't have questions in the chat, but now because we will do small summary and then we will move to the questions, yes, because we had now three inputs on three different types of the therapy that was said that it's not only three that we have, there are much more, <laughs> um, but here we had also our colleagues. And I think that we need to use this opportunity because for me, when I started myself a therapy, I remember it was very hard to explain to therapists about my job <laughs> um, and what we do. And I was always had questions like am I clear enough <laughs> so I think that here we have this um, really opportunity having you as a trainers as well to fully understand us uh, so well that we can have some questions um, to our uh, speakers uh -huh. there is a comment that types of tech Psychotherapists also have differences depending on which part of the world you are and in which language you are co-working with. Yes, as well, the question of the language. Uh, we'll be waiting now because now it's floor for the questions, yes? So if you have any question to any of three of our speakers you can ask with the voice, please just raise up your hand so it's visible. And rise up if you can use the reactions, uh, uh, this special uh, rise up the hand so it will be easier to facilitate it. Questions? Hmm? 
אז ג'וליה? לא? אה, חואן. So hello, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. I am Juan from Iceland. And I am, you know, very interested is in, okay, we are youth workers, we are trainers. I am interested in how can I support the wholesome development of a human being to become from, adolescent stage, psychological stage to become a grown up, an adult person who can take responsibilities, who can deal with the trouble, who can deal with uncomfortable situations, uh, who can, you know, really be an agent of transformation and also of cultural regeneration. This is something like, and I am been following, you know, exploring different things. I have a master in religious studies, in cultural media communication, and I've studied anthrop many other things. But I found this work uh, by Bill Plotkin. I don't know if you know the Animas Valley Institute in, in Colorado. And he works about precisely, you know, how or he described these different stages of development of the human being, the natural development. And he talks about how the late adolescent stage can be described as the journey of soul initiation, where we need to go into the darkness, into the humidity, to explore the mysteries, to explore the limits of our knowledge. And there is a big critique regarding psychotherapy because in many ways, psychotherapy tries to bring people to normality or to, you know, just somehow help to deal with this stress, depression. But in many ways, sometimes we, perhaps we misinterpret these difficult situations or psychological states of mind that are calling for a psycho-spiritual transformation and we try to return people to normality instead of finding ways for the transformation to happen and maybe the dissolution of the ego or, or the personality so the person can reintegrate or integrate themselves in different ways, in new ways that are also more in contact with, you know, ecological meanings and nature and, you know, their soul purpose and so on. Yeah. So and so I am interested in this exploration and I would like to ask you, your three, how do you see this? How do you support the psycho-spiritual transformation of people if they if where they are where they are? And if you are aware of this, or do you think this is bullshit, or just people need to be normal, you know? Thank you very much. I, I can I can give it a go maybe. Um, I don't use the word normality. Uh, first of all, I think it's a concept that can be very debatable. And I was looking that way because I have this book of Gabo Mate that really questions this this question of normality and what does normal mean. I think when when I accompany clients in therapy, I just I said before that I don't have intentions, but at least I have one, uh, which is to make sure that they can live. Uh, as um, well as possible in the world they are in. And whatever that world is, that doesn't belong to me. Um, and and that can give different type of accompaniment. But for instance, when I work with uh, family, um, systemic and family constellations, one of the level you sometimes can work with, according to the founder, Beth Hellinger, is the level of the spirit. And there, it's a lot about spirituality. It's a lot about soul. It's a lot about connecting back to old souls, for instance, and either messages that get stuck generation after generation or the other way around that you carry, uh, but not necessarily in a stuck way from generation to generation. That gives a complete different work than, than you can have in other forms of therapies. Uh, and it has really a lot of spiritual dimension. But... Um, yeah, I don't know if I answer your question, but that was my first try, at least to to connect with the with the dimension you uh, you you brought forward about 
making people fit in normality, at least in, in my approach, but I, I think in the colleagues I work with, this, this has no place. This is really not about that. It's not about making people fit into a, a defined uh, format, into uh, to live according to certain number of norms, but really to make sure that they can live to their full potential the way they want and the way they aspire. I think for me, that's the better uh, definition. So yeah, but maybe Petra and Ivana have other thoughts on that. I don't know. I have very similar thought on that. <laughs> so maybe add just practical example. One of my client, um, she's challenged by schizophrenia, schizophrenia, or I don't know the English <laughs> correct term. And in many, um, also in this, uh, as somebody mentioned, the Western culture, she would definitely be treated by pills, by um, maybe even at the hospital with the treatment. But my approach is kind of that till this moment she survives. She is not doing harm to the others. That's also important. She's not doing harms um, to herself. She just wants to know how to navigate that. And it was kind of uh, challenging, of course, this path and to find uh, this path where she can work with schizophrenia in, um, in her environment. But it works. And now she, uh, yeah, she's constantly, she listens to the voices. But what is normal? For her, this is normal. And she can work with that. And she can fully find her potential and feel this potential and even feel the need she has. That's her normal. My normal would be maybe different. But it's up to me to decide which path I will take. Thank you, Petra. I don't uh, think I have much to add, but um, also about this yeah, uh, term normal, uh, I also don't use it. And um, I also mentioned that this uh, cultural and um, perspective of uh, uh, context where we where we work is, is very important for me. I work with young people who are in Serbia not uh, really considered normal, and it is always a struggle to uh, for them also to find a place and for us to support them in finding a place here or somewhere in the world where they will feel themselves and could express themselves freely. Um, so if the question was about uh, some non-Western perspectives, um, I also kind of believe that uh, um, I, I personally cannot be of help to maybe somebody who is growing up in a really, really different culture, because I don't know if I can relate. I would be curious to know, but I don't know if I could be like um, uh, the best person for that. So this is why I'm um, kind of working here where I am and where I know the context and with people that I can uh, kind of really on a level of, of very similar upbringing and very similar uh, kind of... Um, experiences I can relate because this relationship is also important to to uh, to have on some kind of equal grounds and uh, on a level of understanding. Mm. Uh, thank you for your answers. Yes, today in the world of diversity, when <laughs> I myself as a youth worker as well, we have big diversity among young people. It's bigger than when I was young, I think. <laughs> and it's, yeah, this... Very important what you have said. Uh, we have two minutes left till the end of the webinar. So if there are still questions <laughs> uh, about the um, therapy, about therapy and trainers, I don't know, anything that you have, but short one. Yes, Giselle. Another question. It's a quick comment on the, the last um, uh, comment of Rodolfo in the chat. I think it's uh, even in youth work, you can see that it's very true that in general, we train, we support, we guide according to a set of norms that we believe are the ones that that person should connect with, live by. Uh, even with young people, when we work, it's like they have to fit a certain way in a certain frame. You know, it's like be yourself, but not like that, just like, you know. So I, I completely um, support uh, constantly reminding to ourselves that it's not about making people fit in a set of norms, whether Western or not Western. It's uh, 
I think in therapy, it's really about, I mean, it might sound cheesy, but it's just about being able to live your life in the happiest way and more, I mean, really reaching your potential in the best way possible. And if that means, for some, it might mean fitting the norms because that's what they need in a moment of their life. And I don't think as therapists, it's up to us to tell, no, you don't go that way. Uh, it's just to support that it can go that way the best way possible. But for some others, it would be exactly the opposite. Like, no, I don't want to fit in a in a set of norms. And I want to basically learn how to be fully myself differently elsewhere, whatever. So I think that's where our job um, lies, more or less. I mean, it's very it's a summary yeah, of a summary of a summary. But uh, I, I thank you, Rodolfo, because I think it's really important to underline that. Very, very. And therefore, to Juan, if this is what you were connecting with. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's 7.30. Uh, are you up to stay for last question? If there is, if there is uh, yeah, more questions. Yeah, Juan, maybe someone else, wait a bit, just maybe to give <laughs> space for someone else if they have a question. Juliet, one moment, you had uh, a question, no? Okay. Okay, then if no one, then Juan. Uh, Juan, you we cannot hear you. Mm -mm. Okay, now, I would like to ask you about uh, grieving and grieving practices and how you integrate grieving in your therapy. Yes, thank you. I can, I can, I can try again. Um, it's a, it's a, you have really good questions, Juan. Uh, that because that's also very cultural, by the way. You, the way you approach death and the way you approach grieving. Um, I hadn't had too many cases where I had to deal with that, and there are very different approaches. There are approaches where, if you think, if you think that the person can stand that and is able to go through that you can even value you can really work on the value of death for instance that's one way of coping with with grieving and uh, if you talk about grieving in terms of life and death because grieving can also take other meanings so yeah um other ways can be to work with rituals so rituals of saying goodbye ritual of saying uh, what you are saying goodbye to ritual of saying thank you rituals of uh, uh of um validating the experience when it's about victim and uh, perpetrator relation it might even go to the level and that's also quite spiritual by the way where you are um, recognizing the weight that your perpetrator or the victims were carrying on behalf of others for instance so there are so many different approaches that for me at least it's difficult to uh, to give you only one because it's it's very unique to the experience of the person it's a very delicate work um which at the same time, at least for me, is is uh, is uh, is always um, supporting the approach that I mean, I, I guess I don't need to tell you that, but that life and death are just polarities of the same things, and uh, the moment we start living, we start dying. So it's also um, it really depends, I think, on how the persons are ready to approach grieving, uh, and that I think cannot be answered in just one one way. But again, that's my my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Giselle, for answering. Yeah, Ivana, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I agree. It's really a personal and also cultural. But even when you work in a, in one culture, there are really different ways to grieve. And uh, what is interesting for for me, for example, in in my culture, a lot of the things grieving is stopped uh, by the surrounding, and a lot of people come to therapy feeling all kinds of things, but actually what turns out is that they have this prolonged or kind of uh, grief that was not not finished in a in a healthy way, let's say, or in a in a productive way, or reached the the, the acceptance phase, but they, it's just like stuck and they get stuck with um with these feelings. And then my experience is that um uh, going back there, it's painful, but it's important. And then it's uh, important for a therapist to just be there with a, it's not just, but be there with a client and is all um, 
difficult feelings and uh, contain it and actually showing that it is possible to process it and process possible to be with these feelings and um, maybe silly but stay alive like um, you you can survive this and be kind of okay also on on the other side because I think f people are also um, afraid a lot of, of of feeling all those feelings. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm like grieving. Should we finish the webinar on grieving? <laughs> um, just one question, very fast. Does for you personally, yes or no? Uh, does it really mean what language we use when we go for uh, psychotherapy? Like, should it be my native language or it can be my second language? Just from you. <laughs> you know who, who you are <laughs> pointing at Petra, <laughs> but uh, um, mm, I think, well, my experience is that it's usually better when it's your native language, but if not possible, I work with immigrants here and uh, I have a client who is Ukrainian. He's very good with, with English and we work in English because that's his option. And it's always better to use the, the tools that, that are there uh, uh, if the other um, option is not having therapy and not having the support that you need. So uh, you work with, and like, fortunately I also work a lot in English. So it's, um, I wouldn't say it's my, like my native language but we can communicate and then sometimes add some of the native languages because he's learning Serbian and then it's a um, interesting process. But um, I would say uh, better search for therapy if you need it and not think about the, the language because there are also other ways to communicate. Thank you. Yes, Jose. I can only say that I, I work mostly in English because my clients are... Um living in different countries and that's our common language so except for those who are us or let's say english native uh for many it's their second language uh but it's definitely not the same if i have clients in french which is my mother tongue than in english the nuances the way you you use words and so on is completely different which can also be a, a trap by the way uh because you you might then sometimes be much more focusing on the mind than, than the body uh, responses to uh, to what's happening but um, yeah it, I think it's a question of choice uh, I, I am fully fluent in Spanish for instance but I could not imagine uh, doing therapy in Spanish for whatever reason it would would be very hard at the moment so I think it's still uh, native language might still be as as Ivana said recommended but yeah it's it's again a qu question of, of how do you feel uh, at ease the most and uh, yeah and from my side, I agree that mother tongue, but then it's all about your comfort, but also theory. There is one theory which says that um, using different English, uh, di <laughs> using different languages brings also different personalities or different uh, aspects you're focusing on. So I know that my personality, when I speak in English, <laughs> it's all over the place. <laughs> but in, um, yeah, in Slovak, I'm also kind of, I would say not different person, but maybe some aspects. So it's also part of your system. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, <laughs> for these answers. I like these answers. There is answer. But <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your, for you being with us. Thank you for those of you who joined and stay till the end.